This is Space Time, Series 25, Episode 120. Coming up on Space Time, the largest potentially hazardous asteroid detected near Earth in eight years. Planning for the historic Mars sample return mission moves into high gear. And Russian space junk threatens the International Space Station. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have detected three near-Earth asteroids hiding in the glare of the sun, including a one and a half kilometer wide monster, which could one day pose a threat to Earth. The giant space rock, named 2022 AP7, is the largest potentially hazardous asteroid discovered in the past eight years. Now, an asteroid this size wouldn't really be large enough to cause a mass extinction event, but it could easily wipe out an entire country. The discovery was made during twilight observations by the Dark Energy Camera at the National Science Foundation Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory in Chile. These near-Earth asteroids are part of an elusive population that lurks inside the orbits of Earth and Venus. Now, the problem is this is a notoriously challenging region for observation. That's because asteroid hunters have to contend with the glare of the sun. But by taking advantage of the brief yet favourable observing conditions during twilight, astronomers were able to spot this elusive trio of near-Earth asteroids. As well as the one and a half kilometre wide 2022 AP7, they also discovered 2021 LJ4 and 2021 PH27, which are both on orbits that safely remain completely inside of Earth's orbit. And as an added bonus, PH27 has the closest known orbit of any asteroid to the Sun. And that's exciting because it means it also undergoes the largest general relativity effects of any object in our solar system. Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity explains how massive objects warp the fabric of space-time and how this influenced the motions of objects in the universe. In our solar system, this influence is directly measurable through the precession of the orbit of the planet Mercury, which cannot be accurately explained simply using Newtonian physics. The study's lead author Scott Shepard from the Carnegie Institute says the Twilight Survey has scoured an area within the orbits of Venus and Earth, searching for asteroids, and it's already found several, including two a kilometre across or more, a size Shepard likes to refer to as planet killers and he feels sure there are likely to be a few more near-Earth asteroids of similar size out there yet to be found. Only around 25 asteroids with orbits completely within Earth's orbit have so far been discovered, and that's all because of the difficulty of observing near the glare of the Sun. It means finding asteroids in the inner solar system is a daunting observational challenge. When you think about it, astronomers really only have two brief 10-minute windows every night and morning to survey this area and they still have to contend with a bright background sky resulting from the sun's glare. Also, these observations have to be very near the horizon, meaning astronomers have to observe through a thick layer of the Earth's atmosphere, which can blur and distort their observations. But while observing towards the inner solar system is challenging for ground-based telescopes, it's impossible for space-based observatories like NASA's Hubble and James Webb. That's because the intense light and heat of the sun would simply fry sensitive electronics aboard these spacecraft. It's for this reason that both Hubble and Webb are always pointed away from the sun. Discovering the three new asteroids, despite all the challenges astronomers are facing, was only possible thanks to the unique observing capabilities of DCAM. DCAM is a state-of-the-art instrument, one of the highest performance wide-field CCD images in the world, and it's giving astronomers the ability to capture large areas of the sky with great sensitivity. Astronomers refer to observations as deep if they capture distant objects. And when hunting for asteroids inside Earth's orbit, the capability to capture both deep and wide-field observations is indispensable. DCAM was funded by the US Department of Energy and built and tested by the department's Fermilab. Shepard says large areas of the sky are required because the inner asteroids are rare and deep images are needed because asteroids are faint and you're fighting both the bright twilight sky near the sun as well as the distorting effects of Earth's atmosphere. 
But DCAM can cover large areas of the sky to depths not achievable on smaller telescopes, thereby allowing astronomers to go deeper, cover more sky and probe the inner solar system in ways never done before. As well as detecting asteroids that could potentially pose a threat to Earth, this new research is also an important step towards understanding the distribution of small bodies in the solar system. Asteroids located further from the Sun than the Earth are easiest to detect. So we find more of these and they tend to dominate current theoretical models of the asteroid population. Detecting asteroids inside Earth's orbit helps to redress that imbalance. Detecting these objects also allows astronomers to understand how asteroids are transported through the inner solar system and how gravitational interactions and the heat of the Sun can contribute to their fragmentation. This is Space Time. Still to come, planning for the historic Mars sample return mission moving forward and Russian space junk once again threatening the International Space Station. All that and more still to come on Space Time. The next step in the unprecedented campaign to return scientifically selected samples from Mars has been taken with a formal agreement signed between NASA and the European Space Agency. The two have now agreed to proceed with the creation of a sample tube depot and cache on Mars which will be located at Three Forks, an area near the base of the ancient river Delta which flows into Jezero Crater. The cache will contain samples from carefully selected rocks on the surface of Mars which can help tell the story of Jezero Crater's history and how Mars evolved. More importantly, they could also contain evidence of past life on the Red Planet as if it ever existed there. Scientists believe that the cored samples from the Delta's fine-grained sedimentary rocks deposited in a long dried-up lake billions of years ago are the most likely to contain indications of whether microbial life existed when Mars was a much warmer, wetter world. NASA Associate Administrator for Science Thomas Abuchin says these will be the first scientifically curated collection of samples from another planet. Scientists from NASA and ESA will now review the proposed location and if confirmed, the first samples will be placed at the site by the Mars Perseverance rover later this month. Meanwhile, a duplication copy of each sample will be kept aboard the CARSI six-wheeled mobile laboratory. Duplication of sample collection is one part of a robust plan to ensure mission success. Later on, the Perseverance rover will be the primary means to convey the collected samples to the Mars launch vehicle as part of the sample return campaign. Meanwhile, the Three Forks Depot will serve as a backup hosting the duplicate set. Since Perseverance landed in Jezero Crater back on February 18, 2021, the rover has explored some 13.2 kilometres of the Martian surface, and it's collected some 14 rock core samples during its first two science campaigns. In the course of its first science campaign, the rover explored the crater's floor, a former lake bed, finely igneous rock which forms deep underground from magma or during volcanic activity at the surface. The second science campaign has been highlighted by the investigation of sedimentary rocks formed when particles of different sizes settled in a once watery environment. The rover has also collected one atmospheric sample and three witness tubes. The witness tubes contain material that helps identify potential terrestrial contamination in the tubes that may have come from the rover during sampling operations. Next, Perseverance will travel to the top of the delta, to an area that satellite imagery suggests is geologically very rich and loaded with sediments washed into the delta from further upstream. Apart from the Perseverance rover and its Ingenuity rotocopter, which is scouting out and collecting samples, the complex campaign of Mars sample return will also include two more rocket launches from Earth. One will carry a Mars lander. That'll include a small ascent rocket, which will transport samples from the Martian surface back up into orbit around Mars. The other will carry the return spacecraft that will transport those samples back to Earth and the descent capsule that will parachute the samples down to the ground for scientists to collect. This report from NASA TV. The Perseverance rover is filling up tubes with rocky material from Mars, and it's my job to protect them. What kind of testing are we doing now to make sure that they survive their journey back to Earth? Let's take a look. We are 
close to the base of a nearly 90-foot drop tower here at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Places like this are designed to help test out NASA's most ambitious campaign to date, Mars Sample Return. I'm Raquel Villanueva here with Aaron Yazzi. He's in charge of keeping the sample tube safe on their journey home. So Aaron, what's the plan for Mars Sample Return? Mars Sample Return is the next leg in us being able to bring back rocky samples from Mars to Earth so that we can study them here and look for signs of ancient life. What kind of testing is being done here at JPL to prepare the sample tubes for their journey back to Earth? The sample tubes have already gone through a lot of testing to date, but we're gonna continue testing to make sure that they can survive every leg of this mission. Some of them involve mimicking Mars's environment, practice uh, robotic handling of the tubes, making sure that they can survive each of those steps, the launch environment, the landing environment. Speaking of final descent back to Earth, that's what the engineers are working on behind us. Can you tell us a little bit more about those tests? The tower behind me is actually able to mimic the event from when the canister holding the sample tubes will land back on Earth. One of the designs that we're currently testing out is what kind of crushable material we might, we might want to use inside of that assembly. Um, so a piece of titanium crushable that we're going to use with this mass simulator um, to see how best to cradle and protect these tubes when they land back on Earth. What is being done to ensure that this is a successful campaign? We are currently partnering with agencies across the U.S. Um, and around the world, uh, the most predominant one being the European Space Agency. We're actually working on building a hundred more test tubes that we can distribute to all these teams so they can do all their testing and, and, and ensure that everything will work like they designed it to. What are you most excited about when it comes to Mars Sample Return? I am really excited about all the information that these little rock samples hold inside them, and especially the exciting probability that we could find ancient life. For me personally, I come from an area in the U.S. that looks like Mars. The Navajo Nation is a rocky desert landscape, and it really reminds me uh, how similar rocky planets in our solar system can be. This is space time. Still to come. Russian space junk once again threatening the International Space Station. The world's largest aircraft strata launch takes to the skies. And later in the science report, atmospheric levels of the three primary greenhouse gases all reaching new record highs. All that and more still to come on Space Time. The International Space Station has been forced to undertake emergency action to avoid dangerous debris from a Russian anti-satellite missile test. Mission managers fired the Progress MS-20 thrusters for a 5 minute and 5 second burn in a predetermined deorbit avoidance manoeuvre to ensure the orbiting outpost would fly clear of the fast approaching space junk. The debris was part of the Russian Cosmos 1408, a Soviet-era electronic signals intelligence gathering spy satellite, which was deliberately destroyed in a highly criticised anti-satellite missile test by Moscow last year. The threat of potential collision with this debris cloud has forced the crew of the International Space Station to seek shelter in their escape capsules on several occasions as the orbiting outpost flies past the cloud. There are millions of fragments of space junk ranging in size from tiny paint chips through to giant spent rocket stages now orbiting the planet, and they all pose a threat to space navigation. Scientists can track the larger pieces of debris, those a few centimetres or more in size, but the millions of smaller bits and pieces are simply flying through space at 28,000 kilometres per hour, faster than a speeding bullet, and able to do just as much damage. The world's largest aircraft, a twin fuselage six engine strata launch rock, has undertaken its maiden integrated test flight in the skies above California's Mojave Desert. The test flight saw the giant aircraft, which is a wingspan larger than a football field, carry the Talon A prototype of the planned air launch Talon hypersonic vehicle. Strata launch will ultimately be used to drop launch rockets carrying payloads into orbit. The scaled composite sport aircraft is designed to carry ALTA or air-launch-to-orbit rockets up to 250 tonnes in mass. 
They're carried on the centre pylon between the two fuselage segments beneath the 117 metre long wingspan. The five-hour test flight took off from the Mojave Air and Spaceport carrying the 8.5 metre Talon prototype to an altitude of 7 kilometres or 23,000 feet. The mission was the eighth test flight for the Strata Launch Rock. Its first drop test is slated for next month. That will be followed by a hypersonic test of the Talon early next year, with commercial operations expected to begin before the end of 2023. We'll keep you informed. This is Space Time. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 